we're Dod Dodworth Miners Welfare and we're just about to go on a march and the 40th anniversary of the Miners' Strike. For me, I was at junior school in 1984 and as I was preparing this speech today, I started thinking about my memories and I realised that a lot of my memories seem to be around smells. One of the strongest smells that I remember is the smell of rabbits and hares being skinned in kitchen. The smell, I can remember it now, used to make me gape. And I used to cry when I used to see my dad coming down the garden, got a gun on his shoulder, swinging a brace of rabbits, and I'd think, oh no, it's rabbit for tea, again. And I used to say, but ma'am, I don't like rabbit, and we had no tells to eat, so she'd say, you mean get it eaten? Because all the alternative shit with sugar on. <laughs> and I used to go, but ma'am, I don't like shit with sugar on. And she'd say, well, love, only alternative shit with egg on. <laughs> She's here somewhere and she knows that's true. She did draw a line, however, when he brought home a brace of rabbits and one of them had mixy. The trauma of wild game during that time is probably one of the reasons why I were a vegetarian for most of my twenties. You have no idea because we got a lot of oh, deer there. That's too much, too much. From Round Green Farm. <laughs> I also remember the smell at fire. We had an open fire back then and my mother used to burn absolutely anything and everything to keep me and my little sister warm. Shoes were a favourite, especially slippers. Highly flammable, burn for ages. And we used to watch lights going up chimney, like Barnsley's version of Northern Lights. <laughs> Any excuse to burn out though, she's still the same. Next to a neighbour built a gate under kitchen window. <laughs> Probably to keep us out, to be honest. And he, um, one night after work, Steve come round, says to my mother, knocks on the door, Wins gate? And she said, Ben's were cold, it's on fire. <laughs> True. Absolutely livid, you are. Apparently they do laugh about it now, though. We used to get wood from anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. My dad used to go into Blackburn's wood and come back with full trees that he used to chop up in backyard on an homemade horse that he made. <laughs> Sometimes wood would be covered in creosote. I don't know where he got that wood from, probably not Blackburn's wood. I used to be sent out as young and go and get logs and I used to go out and come back covered in creosote. I do remember that smell very specifically. <coughs> Keeping fire going seemed to be a full-time job as far as I remember. I remember getting woken up at crack of dawn getting in a blue escort van with my dad and his mate Gary and Gary's lad and driving to some slag heap. And we'd get out and my dad would lift fence up and me and lad would crawl under the fence and start filling up sacks of coal, dragging them back to the van. When Dave Roper from Silverwood told a very similar story on that recent BBC documentary and he told that coal collapsed and he thought he were about to meet his mecca. It made me realise, because we didn't at time, it was just an adventure, how dangerous coal picking is, and how I could have died. And indeed, I do know now, as an adult, that two young brothers at Goldthorpe did die picking coal. And it's a reminder to us all about the suffering and the loss that this community endured while we were fighting the entire might of the state. I find it so proud to stand here today to introduce to this 40th anniversary of the Midas strike 
Mr. Arthur Scargill. The privilege today is for me to attend this meeting and say thank you to all those miners who took part in the strike in 1984 and 1985. But I want to, at the start of my contribution, to make a statement. I can't make it on behalf of the NUM because we removed my membership <laughs> That's, uh, a few years ago. But I can speak as president of the International Miners Organization and speak, I will. I want to make a speech about the slaughter of the innocent in Gaza. The slaughter of 30,000 innocent people, including children and the unborn in Gaza, is nothing less than genocide. The perpetrators should be arrested and jailed for life. It is terrible that the fascist state of Israel has continuously bombed and shelled Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem for nearly five months. These territories are the land of Palestine, which Israel has unlawfully occupied since 1967. And unless Israel withdraws, the United States should force it back. If the United States and the United Kingdom could unlawfully invade Granada, Iraq and Libya, they should have no problem driving back Israel to the 1967 line from the occupied territories of Palestine. I will be non-controversial about the strike. <laughs> I'm here today to pay tribute to all those miners and their families and, of course, all who took part in that magnificent dispute. I'll never forget Christmas 1984. Some people say it was a terrible time. I believe my recollection's right. One of the best times we ever had. We had dozens and dozens of juggernauts organized by the French CGT and Alain Simon, and they delivered goods food and a present for every child of miners. And in addition, internationally, countries all over the world took our children for holidays during that bitter struggle that took place for that year. They'll never be forgotten. Forty years ago, the Tory government, led by Thatcher, declared war on the National Union of Mine Workers. The Tories have been preparing for a showdown with the NUM long before they came to power. They could not forget the, the, the victory that the miners inflicted upon the Tory government in 1969, 
1972 and 1974. In the spring of 1982, I was handed a copy of a secret government plan prepared by the coal board earmarking 95 pits earmark for closure with the loss of over a hundred thousand jobs. It became clear in the following period that the union would have to take action. We had to have maximum effect how do we do it? We decided to call a special national delegate conference in 1983, which is before 1984. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that because somebody from the slum might have come in. <laughs> we took a decision at that conference a unanimous decision, including areas later didn't we go with us, to impose a full overtime ban. <coughs> so the dispute was longer than 12 months. Yeah. It was four months before because it started on the 1st of November, 1983. Did it affect the issue? Of course it did. That's why it led to the strike. It succeeded between November, 1983 and February, 1984 in reducing the stocks of coal by 12 million tons. It cut national coal stocks to the same level. It's the same level that had been present before the unofficial strike in 1981. It's often forgotten, you know, by those who cry, we ought to have had a ballot. <laughs> in 1981, without a conference, without a ballot, but faced with pit closures, the miners came out on strike. And within three weeks, we successfully forced Thatcher back. It was a withdrawal. I call it a body swerve. Ian McGregor was appointed as chairman of the National Coal Board. And the effect of the overtime ban was so dramatic that they, they drew a plan to close immediately five pits in four areas. Cortonwood, and Bulcliffe Wood in Yorkshire, Harrington in Durham, Snowdown in Kent, and Palmaise in Scotland. And within a week, McGregor announced on the 6th of March a further 20 pits would be closed in the coming year. An executive committee meeting on the 8th of March, two days later, Scotland and Yorkshire requested permission to take area industrial action. We were faced with area pit closures and therefore we concluded we had to respond with area industrial action. We were faced with an area attack in the belief, mistakenly, that if they could condition miners in certain parts of 
the country. For example, in Nottinghamshire, so Derbyshire or Leicester, that if they didn't vote or take action, their pits would be safe. It was a lie. We knew it was a lie. That's the reason why we had no alternative but to take industrial action on a scale that now is history. In 1984, steel plants were the weak, weakest point and I tried my best to convince the union that we should divide, divest all our efforts against the steelworks. And that meant, of course, places like Orgreave, which supplied the coke. I wanted to see Scunthorpe, Ravenscray, and Port Talbot targeted. Primarily, that was the target I wanted. It wasn't accepted initially by members of the union. I'm talking about in leadership positions. But eventually, they came round to the idea that it was inevitable. They only had three weeks supply of the steel works and they got eight months supply in the power stations. Far more important to attack your enemy at the weakest point rather than the strongest point. Who said that? Thatcher. <laughs> Admitted it in her autobiography. She said, we must do everything we can to stop any attack on our steel plants. Because if they close the steel plants, we fail. She meant the government fail. It's in her autobiography. She devoted a chapter to me. <laughs> I, think, I think she fancied me. <laughs> we knew that they were mounting more and more police. Massive. And all that you heard is true. It was vicious. It was brutal. And of course it was unlawful. But it didn't matter to them. It was a reminiscent battle that could have taken place in the English century civil war. The disorder resulted in dozens being hospitalized including me on the 18th of June. What is ignored or forgotten is at the end of that day, Haslam of British Steel, the chairman, sent to Telex and closed the plant. People don't know that. I'll tell you who gave me a copy of the Telex. <coughs> Nick Jones of the BBC, on the record. The fundamental difference between Saltney in 72 and Orgreave in 84 was that following the first closure at Saltney, picketing was increased. And that's why massive pickets were joined by the working class of the area including the AU and the TNG. If the same procedure had happened on the 18th of June, 1984, and the trade unions had been increased in the, in the picketing, the outcome would have been different. 
But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, the chances of troops being brought in was a real threat. The plan was there. I've met them since. I travelled with Tony Ben on the train from Durham about six years after. And a young policeman said, uh, I was at, uh, at Orgreave. And we said, were you? He says, yeah, we were deployed. And we were told that we were there until the miners were defeated. But they are reserve powers. And they were prepared to bring in troops. I did a question time program in Ireland, Northern Ireland. And afterwards they put me in a hotel. And the bloke who was in charge of the evening, there were no sandwiches or anything. <laughs> I, I asked him, uh, can I get a cup of tea and a sandwich? And he said, certainly. And he started to serve me. He says, Long time since I saw you last. I says, have we met? He says, yeah, we met at Orgreave. I said, oh. I said, which pit? He says, I wasn't in the pit. I was on the other side. He said, but I, I was in the armed forces. But I had to be dressed as a police officer. And he was involved in it. So that took place. And we've got a right to understand what was taking place on the 18th of June. It was a state attack, an organised attack on the trade union movement. Negotiations. What happened? We settled the miners' strike five times. And every time we reached an agreement, Thatcher intervened. Don't believe me, I, I hate to say, don't go and buy a copy of Thatcher's book, but it's in Thatcher's book, take it from me. We well, met on the 3rd of March, 1985. And after a bitter, and sometimes <coughs> really rakish conference we had to take a vote the three national officials made clear that they would not support any return to work we called upon the union to stay out the vote when it took place was carried by 98 votes to 91 the three national officials were amongst the 91 calling for the strike to continue. We were so close to victory and yet here we were being told to go back to work. I knew that the stock position even in the power stations couldn't carry on. <coughs> The chairman of the CEGB had accepted long well afterwards that they couldn't have carried on had we been able to carry on. I'll never forget the international support we got. That strike made all of you international heroes and heroines. There's never been a dispute like this that strike since the toll puddle artists or the chartists or the diggers or the levelers that strike in 1984-5 is on a par with them the minor strike of 1984-5 remains an inspiration for workers but a reminder for today's trade union leaders of their responsibility to their members and the need to come together in direct action to challenge the government 
and employers in all forms of injustice and inequality and exploitation consigned to the dustbin. It's a privilege to be here today. I'm knocking on a bit now. <laughs> but I, I still have the fervour that I had as a 15-year-old boy at Woolley Colony where I worked for 19 years. I can tell you tonight, today, you walked into history in 1984-5 and you also entered the pantheon of working class heroes and heroines and your, your names are known all over the world as the great strike of 1984-5 in Great Britain. The privilege today is mine. I support you. Um, how have you kept going? I mean, you're still fighting um, for justice, for Palestine, for other causes. I mean, what is it in you that, I mean, you've not been defeated. I mean, there's that saying, the miners united and everything, you've never been defeated. What is it in you, you think, that keeps you going? My faith. I've got a faith in socialism, a faith in Marxism. I've had it since I was 15 years of age. And I'll have it till the day I die. I believe that young people today will eventually see common sense and get rid of the Tory party, yes, the Tory government. But above all, they expose this social democratic uh, capitalist Labour Party, which are a disgrace. Well, the relevance of the miners' strike to young people was brought home to me when I moved up to Sheffield in 2012. I've been a socialist since I was 15. I was at the generation where we'd seen the imperialist wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we'd seen the bankers uh, crashing the economy and the cuts from the Tory government coming after the rest of us. They closed my youth services connection. Uh, they tried to privatise my local hospital, NHS Hinchinbrook. When I moved up to Sheffield, I met Derbyshire miners for the first time. The first Derbyshire miner I ever met was a man named Ian Whitehouse. If you're watching Ian, hiya. Uh, Ian told me that he felt like because they'd lost, they'd let us generation down. He said there wouldn't be zero hour contracts now for young people if the miners had won that fight. Well, Ian, you never let us down. You fought the good fight. And we would be letting you down if we didn't carry on the struggle. 